Hey, this is Dr. Ben White, host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Ben White, and this is the Functional Medicine Discussion Group meeting tonight. We'll be discussing a functional medicine approach. Our topic for tonight is healing from traumatic brain injuries, including ones that have happened in the past, using a functional medicine approach. A traumatic brain injury, which may or may not include a concussion, is caused by sudden damage to the brain caused by a blow or jolt to the head. Common causes include car or motorcycle crashes, falls, sports injuries, and assaults. And according to the CDC, there are over 2 million new head injuries in the U.S. Dr. Kaban Ch Dr. Kabran Chapak is a naturopathic doctor and a staff physician at Amen Clinics and the author of Concussion Rescue, a comprehensive program to heal traumatic brain injury. Dr. Chapak uses a functional and integrative approach to the treatment of patients with traumatic brain injuries, Alzheimer's and dementia, and dementia, PTSD, and anxiety disorders. Dr. Chapak, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dr. White. Excellent. All right, let's get into it. So. Um, yeah, I've been working at Amen Clinics the past 10 years, and uh, a lot of the patients that we see have had a traumatic brain injury, as you mentioned, and some of them didn't know they had it until we scanned their brain. So we're known for doing brain spec imaging. We're going to talk about ways to assess the brain, uh, including spec imaging, but also things you can do in the office, uh, including lab tests or um, cognitive tests. They're very useful and can be done, you know, tomorrow. Um, and why I'm so passionate about this is that it's a, it's a really a common problem. You know, three million Americans go to the emergency room every single year uh, with a concussion. So those are the ones we know about. But how many kids on the soccer field or friends, loved ones, they bonk their head and they see stars? That's enough to have it to be considered a concussion or brain injury. If there's any uh, symptom, uh, which is such as seeing stars, feeling a little dizzy, woozy, that's enough to be considered a concussion. And then there's also the subconcussive hit to the brain that we know from football players who have many hit, repeated hits to the head. That's cumulative damage and can cause uh, brain injury and inflammation in the brain. Really there's two main points to this talk that I want to convey. It's very simple. The first is that um, traumatic brain injuries are a significant cause of mental illness in this country, uh, including depression, anxiety, uh, anger problems, headaches. Um, and it's, it's not being recognized, you know, because we can't see the brain or we think I'm fine. I hit my head. I saw stars. I'm fine. But then, if symptoms don't occur immediately, um, I think, okay, it must be due to something else. And we'll talk about that. Uh, the second point is that while there's a standard concussion protocol and there's standard treatments, which are great, the approach is not comprehensive enough. We need to take a more holistic approach. We need to look at treating the causes of uh, healing or the causes of damage and um, just really more thoroughly help these patients out. Um, and so these two main points, and we can yeah, ask questions, we can discuss. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to this. And um, my plan was to go through some of the mechanisms very fairly quickly, some of the myths, some of the science of how it works, and then get into some of the uh, treatment strategies. Because I really want you to have that in your tool bag as you start working with patients. Um, the first thing is just, I would say at Hingman Clinics, just to, to pick it up, first of all. I mean, we see so many people 
Uh, and you know, we can we can fall into the pattern of treating our patients with depression with a certain approach or look for certain things psychologically. But you know, one in six of the patients that we see at Amen Clinics have had a brain injury when, on their scans, and some didn't know about it. And so it's important to ask. Uh, and you, if you've ever heard Dr. Amen speak, he talks about this, where he's asked patients, "Okay, so." Uh, did you have you ever fallen out of a tree off of a log? Uh, had a car accident? Played contact sports, and they'll say no, no, no. But then they'll, oh yeah, I, I did fall off my bike when I was ten, and that does that count? And maybe that's when depression symptoms started. And you can, it's a different approach, it's a different treatment approach um, if there's brain injury. So first off, just make ask your patient multiple times. It's kind of like in functional medicine if someone uh, has environmental illness, they may not think they have a moldy house, so you have to ask them specifically, uh, do you have any mold in your home? Have you had a roof leak, flooding, uh, mildewy smelling basement, ever had water damage? Uh, it helps to ask specifically about brain injury. People tend to blow it off, not think about it, just sort of forget about it. And and by the way, we, Dr. Chepek, you can have a uh, traumatic brain injury without actually hitting the head, correct? Correct. Correct. Yes, you can have um, just by having whiplash. You know, if you if it's enough to cause damage to the neck, that that um, rapid acceleration deceleration force can certainly damage the very fragile tissues in the brain. In fact, if you take a brain out, a fresh brain, and set it on the countertop it'll be goo in several hours just because it kind of melts it's so so fragile um the other thing to keep in mind is that it can be delayed symptoms can be very often delayed i had this pastor who came in uh who had a car accident and he was fine for the first week or so but then the next sunday he couldn't write a sermon because he had had this car accident and inflammation had gotten to the point finally where he started having symptoms. This is a really common problem. I had this other guy who was a, um, a baseball player and he was an outfielder and he was running for the ball and he collided with another outfielder and lost consciousness just for a couple seconds. And uh, he was apparently fine until the next day. And he started having anterior grade amnesia. Um, but it was like 50 first dates. If you've ever seen that, uh, uh, movie where, um, you know, she can't form a new memory. So he had about four days of memory, uh, and they thought he was faking it or he was depressed or something like that, but it was actually due to brain injury. They thought because it was a day apart, it must, couldn't, couldn't have been due to brain injury, but it, it clearly was when they scanned his brain. Let's see, this is to illustrate how soft the brain is. It's about the consistency of jello. And look how hard the skull is. You know, it's just, that's why it can be so easy to damage the brain. Um, these are common symptoms. It doesn't have to be loss of consciousness, but certainly it w that would count any of these symptoms confusion, memory loss, feeling dazed. Uh, your common symptoms. And, and uh, Ben talked about um, the, some of the myths we had. There's all of these myths. So if you were in a helmet, you can't have had a concussion. Um, if you've had a negative MRI or CT scan, wasn't a concussion. You know, these, these myths, concussions all the time, or brain injuries all the time. Um, symptoms starting days later. I uh, don't have to lose consciousness. All of those are symptoms of concussion. Or, or those are uh, myths. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know. I think popular um, storytelling uh, really ex exaggerates the, the myth of um, uh, that people are fine after. It makes a really good um, movie plot if someone gets knocked out and then they wake up later. Um, but then oh, they don't have any light sensitivity. They're not confused. They're just can keep running and going like these people would have post-concussion syndrome and be disoriented. And, you know, I think it, it, it adds to the diminishing, uh, symptoms of concussion. 
And so here's a standard protocol. Um, you know, this is, you know, baseline testing preseason, uh, referral to a medical provider. If there's uh, symptoms, see a doctor, see a coach, see a trainer. This is all good stuff. I mean, we don't want to not do these things. Uh, we just need to go further, further than Tylenol and Advil and, and uh, ice. We're going to talk about more, more than that. That's really important. Um, I wonder the what actually happens. Well, mostly what we'll be seeing in our practices are due to secondary changes from brain injury, not primary. Primary injury is actually ripping of neurons, shredding of tissue. Um, it's the, the secondary injury is essentially due to this cascade of inflammatory and oxidative stress on the brain that continues. So uh, it's really low grade. It's like a fire that smolders. And um, I think why symptoms are sometimes delayed until a point the swelling gets bad enough or the cells that are damaged finally degrade. Um, the, one of the mechanisms is essentially uh, there is a massive glutamate dump. So brain injury, uh, there's this glutamate release. It kicks up the, um, the circuitry in the mitochondria. All of this excess of calcium floods. Um, that excites the mitochondria. Uh, there's free radical production and oxidative stress. Um, there's glucose deficiencies and utilization is, is low um, by glucose transporters. Um, it's, a, it's really a kind of a complex cascade. And um, it's more than just inflammation. There's low blood flow and oxidative damage and stress. Um, it's really interesting. This uh, researcher, this is actually an undergrad researcher at Stanford, Theodore Roth, and he did a, uh, some, some studying uh, of mice, and, and he was able to implant an intracranial microscope into the skulls of these mice, and then poor little mice, they got a brain injury, and you're able to see what happens. Um, so uncompressed means uninjured, and the red line is um, a blood vessel. And then these green squiggles are um, microglia, sort of the immune cells in the brain, like the macrophages that are supposed to eat up damaged tissue. And so on the right side, after compression, you could see in real time sort of this injury and then these macrophages, microglia swell and start building up and pulling uh, in tissue and there's dead cells and there's less blood flow. So that had never before been seen. Uh, but I, what I thought was very fascinating that he did next was he applied glutathione, this antioxidant, to the mouse skull and saw that if glutathione was applied immediately, there was 67% uh, less cell death. And if applied within three hours, there was 51% less cell death. So he changed the outcome for these mice brain cells. Um, with this very simple but powerful intervention. Um, so showing the microglia macrophages on the left, they're nice and swollen, but with glutathione, they go back to their un, you know, normal size. Um, so I, that's a huge insight. When we think about brain injury, like we need to go back to the, I love this quote from Seth Godin, we need to go back to the drawing board. Isn't the drawing board the, place where all the best work happens. It's not a bad thing. It's the entire point in that we now understand the mechanism more clearly. We don't want to just watch and wait and hope the brain gets better. Yeah. And the brain is your most important asset. So why would you let our children just sort of get concussions and then wait and see if they have you know, alleviation of symptoms? Um, you know, it's, it's common around 29, depending on the research you look at, between 29 and 60% of people who have a concussion, it will go on to become a chronic, uh, you know, post-concussion syndrome, a chronic brain injury. And we have this window of time in which to act. Like if you twist an ankle, 
on the field of play or you hit your head um, or, you know, you know, to, we all know to grab ice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Like it's sort of just it's so, so clear. Everyone knows that almost even before you see the swelling start, someone's grabbing ice. Oh, you hit, you knocked your ankle. It's twisted. Let's get it. But when we hit our heads, we just kind of watch, wait, test, you know, why don't we apply and do things immediately that will save cells, brain cells, and maybe prevent post-concussion syndrome? Um, there's actually a lot of data out there um, about this. And really the reason I wrote this book, because there's a lot of research, I put it together to share it with people because there's millions of people having concussions all the time and, and they may not know about this. I keep going. Questions so far? No, I think we're good. So what would be a better approach? How should we approach this then? Um, well, in addition to the standard protocol, um, we want to correct structural integrity. I'm talking to one of the world-renowned chiropractors, Dr. White, here. <laughs> and we're going to talk a lot about structural integrity so important. Something I missed actually for the first few years working at AIM and thinking about brain injury after a critical piece. Um, sleep has to be a key, key piece. Um, nutrition, supplements, exercise, and, and brain retraining. So we'll talk about all these things. Um, I think a better approach would be, uh, you know, doing um, some labs in addition to all of these things and uh, some imaging. So spec imaging, of course. Um, but you can also do pencil paper tests. So there's the TBI from BrainLine, which assesses for trauma, behavioral change, impact on daily functioning. So it's a list <laughs> of questions that can be done. The NSIVA uh, Ohio State University has a TBI identification method. Um, there's the MOCA, which we use for um, assessing for dementia and mild cognitive impairment, but it's also useful for assessing uh, levels of functional impairment from uh, brain injury and other cognitive conditions. So Is that kind of in general? To... Would most of the cognitive assessment tools for dementia also be beneficial in this realm? A lot of them would, yeah. Like the many mental status, the MOCA. Um, what about the CNS vital so. signs? Yeah, I we do a version of that um, called total brain assessment, but CNS vitals is a really robust um, method to assess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cause you want to measure cognitive domains and attention processing speed, um, executive functioning, uh, recall and short-term memory. You just want to get all of that if you can and see where, cause some people have deficits in more with focus or some more with memory or some more with behavior like irritability or depression. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's individualized. Um, so actually, oh, yeah, that was my next slide. So, um, impact testing, CNS vital signs, uh, total brain, there's apps, uh, CRR, concussion recognition and response. It's kind of nice because coaches or um, athletes can use this and you can track symptoms with it and it gives suggestions and things. So it's, it's helpful. Um, what would you say uh, for, say, uh, a chiropractor or somebody treating musculoskeletal mm -hmm. injury, somebody comes in with a whiplash injury and what would be the easiest way to just get some sense whether there might be a head injury? Because a lot of times the, the patients aren't quite clear. They did a CAT scan of their brain at the uh, hospital and the hospital says, well, everything's fine. Yeah, I, I think if they're having any symptoms, uh, my, my threshold would be very low. I think just based on the patient's symptoms, um, they, you know, and they're, and they hit their head. I would say, yes, you have a concussion, um, need to be treated. And it, you know, you can do, uh, cerebellar tests and, 
uh, looking in their eyes and looking for nystagmus and things like that. But oftentimes those are, are negative. If they're positive, I think that's one thing is with the eyes and, and some of the, you know, I don't know, functional neurology um, chiropractors are really into that. Yeah. And very useful. Very okay. useful. A good question. And, and imaging, of course. So very interested in imaging. And there's a difference between MRIs, which is looking at structure and uh, functional imaging, like SPECT imaging, PET imaging, uh, that looks more at function. And, and um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is, a, uh, this is not a patient. It's from a movie, the movie Whiplash. But it reminds me of a patient that I had who was a jazz drummer. Uh, we'll call him Jeremy. And he had been suicidally depressed since around the age of 14 to 15. Um, been on several different classes of medication, working with a great therapist, and still just, you know, drinking alcohol, using cannabis. It was the only thing that kind of alleviated some of his symptoms. And uh, he um, was really struggling. And he came in, and this is what his brain looked like. This is him on the left. So there's asymmetrical decrease. This is the bottom of the brain. Color doesn't matter. Um, This is the left temporal lobe. And this is the prefrontal cortex. So his left side was very damaged and injured. And the the right is a healthy scan, healthy brain. should look very full and round. Um, And... Uh, I said, Jeremy, when did you have a head injury? He said, I I never have had a head injury. What are you talking about? Uh, And I said, well, okay. Hmm. Have you ever fallen out of a tree, off a log, had a bike accident, car accident? No, no, no. Uh, Ever played contact sports? Oh, okay. I I did start playing football around age, you know, 13, 14. It was tackle football. I was a scrawny little kid. I was matched up against the coach's son and he would just tackle me so hard. And I would feel kind of dazed. And so, so he had had these head injuries and brain injuries that he didn't realize were brain injuries because he couldn't see it. Um, and so we started treating him for brain injury instead of for depression uh, and tra- focusing on these areas of the brain. And he started to improve. He stopped drinking alcohol, stopped smoking pot, um, no more suicidal thoughts and started getting into his jazz drumming, getting better and eventually went to college for uh, music. He went to the Bos- Ber- Berkeley school of music in the Northeast uh, in Boston and doing great, you know, several year- years later. Um, so I think this is helpful if patients have tried lots of things, they're having mental health symptoms, Think brain injury. Ask them like at least four or five times, have you ever had a brain injury? And look at treating using some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, Can you get that? Is there any way to get that same type of um, imaging through an MRI, maybe doing an MRI with volume? I I do like the volumetric MRIs. Yeah, those are useful. They're still... Uh, especially in, in kids, you know, there's so much brain reserve. This is not going to show up. Um, okay. So spe- I just hate, imaging. hate using, uh, you know, a, a form of imaging that requires radiation and, and using yeah. a contrast agent as well. Correct. Correct. There is, yeah. There's no contrast, but there is some radiation. It's about equivalent to a head CT or CAT scan. Okay. Um, it, so there is some, but it's not a lot. Okay. And, yeah, I think so. Sure no contrast in a spec scan. Mm-mm. No okay. contrast in a spec scan. Pure radiation and salt water, and um, there's really no risk of allergic reaction. But yeah, there is a small dose of radiation. So, um, okay. and there's clinics all around. You can refer and just order scans at our clinics, um, and that's that's one option. But um, yeah. There's other ways to assess too, like asking them the questions and and uh, doing some of the cognitive testing is is a good is a good way. Sure. Um, uh, clearly, uh, football damages uh, a child's brain. 
Um, and this is healthy. This is 16 years. This is from a professional athlete on the right. Um, just holds everywhere. Uh, likely headed towards CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Can't be diagnosed. Uh, you know, it's just diagnosed on autopsy. But we have worked with a lot of these football players, and they're headed towards towards that. You know, um, from that, uh, chronic traumatic. In, in terms of kids uh, playing football. Is it yeah. more dangerous if they uh, play football? At a, at, is there a certain age like, oh, it's better if they hmm. not get a trauma before a certain age because the brain is more vulnerable or? Yeah, I mean, I would say before age 25. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, I well, so this study that they did yeah, I mean, I think the younger they are, the, the worse it's going to be. That's a good point. I don't really, it's a good question. I don't know if they look at it. This, this study was done with fMRI, uh, ages 15 to 19-year-old males, and they found that um, essentially the, the punchline is uh, they scanned three groups. One group had known concussion, and the second group had no known concussion, in the third group, they didn't think they had had um, any brain injury from playing football, but it turns out that they did from neurocognitive testing and fMRI. And so just showing hitting your, you know, sub-concussive hits were made an impact. And it was 11 of these players age 15 to 19. So, gosh, I think, um, you know, flag football, <laughs> something else. <laughs> um you know, I, I love sport and stuff, but it's, it's you know, kind of protected. And, and how bad is it now. to head a soccer ball? Also yeah. bad. Yeah, I'm a soccer player. It's, uh, I cringe, you know, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty heavy. I don't know if it's, I just saw a soccer player today. Um, he's uh, 60 now, but you could see some denting in the, in the frontal lobe. Um, and it's likely from you know, lots of headers. So not, not helpful. Worsens focus and, and that, I think. Um, yeah, I've headed lots of soccer balls too. And I played soccer and I, I love, I love the game, but I wish that, you know, there was a way to play without headers somehow. Um, anyway. Uh, is, is it wearing a helmet in soccer? Do you think that's beneficial? I think, I think that would help. Yeah, I think that would help lessen the blow. I think people would still get those subconcussive hits, but it would be a lot better, especially for you know crosses, um, you know, or big kicks that you're. When I was playing at um, you know inter, inner sort of mural low low level, I would just chest it, you know, and they're like, "Hey, why didn't you hit the ball? You could have hit." Oh, no, not worth it for me. <laughs> you know, got some flack for that, but. Um, this is just a study showing, comparing SPECT to MRI. So essentially 99% of the reviewed articles, this was a uh, meta-analysis of 212 studies showing that SPECT really does pick up subtle differences, whereas CT and MRI are useful for blood uh, bleeding risk, but not so useful for picking up mild injury. Um, just another brain injury showing low cerebellum, which happens as well. Um, I think this is useful to measure lab tests. So learned a lot about this from Dr. Mark Gordon. Um, and uh, he's really um, done a lot for teaching about um, pituitary dysfunction from brain injury causing many of the concussive symptoms that we attribute to brain injury are actually due to low hormones. Um, low cortisol, low testosterone, low thyroid, um, and repleting those can be significantly helpful. Uh, yeah, this is Mark Gordon here. Um, and that can be tested with a simple blood test. Um, this is Dr. Kevin Yuen. He's also, he's a neuroendocrinologist. He's down at, um, the Barrow Institute in Arizona, and essentially published that, yeah, 28% of retired NFL football players have 
uh, pituitary deficiency and low testosterone or low growth hormone or both. And uh, need do, to be repleted. Do you use IGF-1 as a measure of growth hormone? Yes, I think. Um, and what, 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 what level of IGF-1 do you consider problematic? <laughs> so IGF-1, um, IGF-1 and IGF-BP3. Those are the two. And I what's, think. What's the second I, one? IGF, B is in boy, P is in papa, three. Okay. And I believe that IGF-1 has a 10-minute half-life, and IGF-BP3 has 24-hour. Um, it's much longer than actual growth hormone, which is just second. You know, right. It's not as, it's always going to be low pretty much if you test it in the morning, but IGF-1, igf three. So the reference range for Dr. Gordon is around 200 or above. And so a lot of the hormone folks are really into, you know, higher levels better. And then you go over here and talk to the longevity folks and low. Well, Walter Longo, and it's, he says it should be below 175. That mm -hmm. So there's this tug of war. And so what's, who's right? You know, it's, I think it's, um, I think it's a matter of uh, finding balance. You know, what's going on with that patient? Do they have symptoms? Do they have low muscle mass? Do they have you know, significant fatigue. Um, maybe they need a boost and, and their growth hormone needs to be higher. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, it's interesting. It's a um, on that. Jama asked, and what do you do if the pituitary is spewing out ACTH after traumatic brain injury while cortisol is low? Hmm. So if ACTH is high, uh, then the pituitary is working, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, um, injured, but it seems the adrenal glands are not responding to that, you know, so figure out what's going on with the adrenals would be my answer to that. And it may be due to the stress and the trauma of the brain injury, maybe due to sleep or insomnia problems like that. Um, and, and you, do you, uh, check adrenals with the salivary cortisol test? I do prefer that. Yeah, the four point salivary cortisol. I'll often do a, a morning blood um, cortisol test because we're ordering other labs as well. But if we really want to assess adrenal function, it's that four point cortisol is the way to go. Um, yeah, the, the three big ones uh, to look at gonadotropins and growth hormone corticotropin and adrenals and thyroid. So the sex hormones, the adrenals and the thyroid and growth hormone. And pregnenolone, of course. So the precursors, DHA and pregnenolone, which, you know, if you're having adrenal problems, that, that may be part of the issue um, is, is needing the precursors. And, uh, you know, they studied pregnenolone and veterans and mild TBI and found it helps with insomnia, irritability, hypervigilance, because it's this calming um, sort of increasing GABA receptor activity in the brain. That's like a neurosteroid. And, really um, really and interesting. Mm -hmm. Anxiety. And I think it's keynotes would be anxiety and um, memory for pregnant alone. And sometimes, yeah, you'll need it. See, it feeds over here into cortisol. And so I find it very helpful to add pregnenolone and DHA if you're working on adrenal dysfunction. Interesting. So uh, let's say it's a man. What level of pregnenolone do you like to supplement with? Well, I'll do lab tests to try and get them to around 100. Um, okay. But, you know, 30 usually don't need more than 30 to 60 milligrams a day, male or female. Okay. Um, yeah. Good question. You know, and progesterone is, uh, there's actually uh, hundreds of studies on progesterone and TBI. It seemed to hold a lot of promise as one of the, you know, a treatment for t traumatic brain injury, like severe traumatic brain injury in the hospital, in the ER. But when they got to larger scale studies, uh, it failed to show benefit. Um, and the reason is uh, similar to 
what Dr. Bredesen will share with you is that when it comes to the brain, it's not one thing that causes the problem. Remember, it's this whole cascade of oxidative damage, inflammation, doing one, only one thing is not really going to help ultimately. It's like the diet, the sleep, the structural, the hormones, the supplements, like really a comprehensive approach, a functional medicine or naturopathic medicine approach is really the, the way to go. Um, Do you sometimes supplement so, progesterone for men with head injury? Yeah, I, if they have a traumatic brain injury, I will not hesitate to give progesterone. Interesting for them. So you can do topical, you can do oral. Um, I may use a little lower dose, but um, you know the the doses typically they use in these studies are around 200 milligrams a day. Um, and the trial that failed was called the Synapse trial. Um, and, you know, I've reached out to some of the researchers and talked with them. And um, it's, uh, I think, I think it's, it's very helpful still. I think it's part of the protocol um, in, in my book um, to use for, you know, severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, so in my book, I don't have it. There's like this chapter on the, first aid for your brain, kind of what to do immediately after. Um, I don't really have progesterone there, progesterone, because, you know, I don't want everyone just taking progesterone willy-nilly. Um, but I think it is a useful, it's a useful per, uh, aspect. Yeah, it's a great um, clinical pro. I don't, I don't normally include pregnenolone and progesterone when I test hormones in men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And for this situation, yes, it would be indicated. Um, this guy, so he was a gunner in the um, army, in the Marines, and um, he had, you know, headaches, fatigue, depression, suicidal thoughts, very low libido, uh, extreme agitation, and irritability. Couldn't be around his girlfriend. So here's his testosterone for a 30 year old like really good shape, you know, he was, um, very fit. Uh, and you can see here is LH and FSH were just really low 1.6, 1.5 low testosterone for his age really should be closer to 600. And for him, we used clomiphene. So stimulating, um, the gonads, stimul stimulating the testes to produce testosterone. He's 30. We don't want to use actual testosterone. And, um, you know, went back up to actually a thousand. So, and all of his symptoms went away. Headaches gone, energy back, libido up, you know, not agitated. So it's kind of this thing about low testosterone can actually be irritability as much as too high a testosterone can be irritability as well. Um, Goldilocks. Uh, so some of these symptoms, I think, can be, again, due to Po, uh, low pituitary function. Um, so here's a yeah an uh, option for lab panel, lots of tests to do. Um, structural, very important. This is these are just seven philosophical principles of naturopathic medicine. Um, address and in physical alignment. As I said, I was missing this for a while, and when I realize, oh my gosh, this is key, uh, really was helpful. Uh, especially if someone is having dizziness, daily headaches, daily headaches, pressure, fullness in the head, never goes away. We want to think about impingement on this cerebrospinal fluid flow and blood flow. Uh, this can be addressed with physical therapy, chiropractic, cranial sacral, uh, and upper cervical chiropractic in particular. Um, so essentially, um, Scott Rosa has done a lot of research in this area. Misalignment of C1 and C2 brought on by head or neck trauma can contribute to either distension of the cerebellar tonsils down through the foramen magnum, so the cerebellum sort of plugging the um, spinal cord and causing impingement and flow, or um, just misalignment and impinging upon CSF flow and blood flow. Here's a picture of that uh, on the side view. So the stenosis or the blockage of the spine here and then 
cooling of CSF, which looks white here in the in the prefrontal cortex, and then reduction of that stenosis due to an adjustment, probably, um, then the, the brain is gray again and normal, so it's flowing. So don't this is this is a very important one. And sometimes on MRI, this gets missed. And so Scott Rosa is into doing an upright MRI. So standing or sitting in an, in an upright posture can, can uh, reveal the um, impingement. So, for example, the cerebellar uh, tonsils are descending down into the space where they shouldn't be. And then lying down, it, it's normal. So the just gravity kind of pulls the brain back up. Um, I think so I refer I'm actually curious what your thoughts are Dr. Weiss um, I refer a lot to upper cervical or nuca chiropractors really focus on that area or cranial sacral therapists that are really highly skilled to help with structural integrity what are your thoughts about that or other approaches I'm eager to learn yeah sure I think that makes sense as well as um uh ne chiropractic neurologists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know they're also yeah. trained to use specific exercises and some other approaches mm -hmm. especially i find if there's dizziness um i just yeah functional neurology that's just really helpful um dysautonomia problems like sort of pot symptoms um uh and and that very very helpful yeah, we. I, I'm not an upper cervical chiropractor, but we regularly adjust the upper cervical spine, and mm -hmm. a lot of times find Good. that very helpful for headaches and and some of these other yeah. symptoms. Oh, that's good to hear. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I think that's key. Um, sleep, very important, of course. And why is this? You know, thirty to seventy percent of TBI patients have sleep problems, so just make sure to address that and why is it the case um one study showed low melatonin production after tbi sometimes just giving melatonin helps i'd say that that's a smaller percentage but it does help um hypocretin is this wake promoting chemical which is suppressed so you feel kind of tired during the day and, and um just can't sleep well at night i think also just the neurons are damaged and the brain is firing improperly and sort of Brain's awake when it's supposed to be asleep and sleepy when you're supposed to be awake. Shifting to nutrition, very important topic. Um, so we know that the brain is really a hungry organ. It uses 20 to 30% of calories in the diet, just straight to the brain. Uh, so imagine your plate, like that's a quarter of what you're eating is just for your brain. And so after... Uh, what this diagram is showing is that after a brain injury, there's this orange line, which is a spike in glucose, but then a drop. And so it, it goes up and then it goes down and it will stay low for long periods of time. So, so there's, there's low glucose because glucose transporters are damaged. Brain can't use glucose as well. That's what we think. Um, and uh, so how, what do we do about that? Um, so doesn't the brain need, need glucose? Like it's, it's the main fuel source. Yes. Uh, and in fact, um, there's another fuel source that the brain loves, which is ketones. Uh, so ketogenic diet, very popular fad diet, but there's a lot of, uh, neurological benefit to the ketogenic diet. No, number, number of studies, um, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's and, migraine headaches, uh, seizure disorders. Ketogenic diet is useful for many different conditions. If it's right for you, it can be very helpful. Um, there's an ongoing study right now with humans and ketogenic diet. Uh, so it, there's not a lot of data, but there's no other diets for TBI and it has the most, most evidence to date. Um, they gave glucose to some uh, patients that had had uh, a brain injury and found that actually it suppressed ketogenesis. So there was some degree um, of ketogenesis, like the brain is actually using 16% uh, 
uh, ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate for fuel after these, for these comatose patients. Um, their brain was using some ketones for fuel and some glucose, but they gave them IV glucose and it completely suppressed the, the ketone production. And so it made, made things worse. So you don't want to just give sugar, basically. Um, and, and if you're hospitalized, you're going to get that, right? It's, it's likely you're going to get some version of that, yeah. Um, and, you know, the other crazy thing is that... Um, they used to give corticosteroids as the standard of care for in the ER for um, TBI because it was, we think, okay, inflammation, corticosteroids suppress everything good, but more people were dying who had that done because it's not just a simple thing. You don't want to just suppress everything. Um, and so they don't do that. That's not a standard of care anymore. Uh yeah, it's a multifaceted approach. You want to do things that are gentle, broad spectrum, multiple mechanisms of action like food, like supplements, like you know, herbs and plants. Um, so I'm a big fan of ketogenic diet if it's right for you. Uh, oh goodness, this is a story about a teacher that essentially had to stop working because of a brain injury. And um, doctor told her, you're going to recover in two weeks. Three weeks later, she couldn't do her job. You know, three months, she's um, actually, I saw her six months. She hadn't been working for at least six months. She's on long term disability, couldn't look at screens, couldn't read. Um, and uh, she started the ketogenic diet, was one of the elements, that was one of the key things that helped her. And uh, she found that she was able to start working again. Eventually, energy came up. Um, and yeah, and, and another thing that helped her was upper cervical work. Yeah. Can you point out um, on these images what, what yeah. we're looking at? What we're looking at. Oh, yeah. So um, on these little bumps uh, here in the middle are the temporal lobes and they're kind of bumpy. They're kind of squared off. They should be rounded full like tires or balloons filled up. The temporal lobes are damaged, uh, memory issues, uh, mood issues, light sensitivity. And then on the top, on the right, there's these bumps in the back it's where she kind of hit her head was, was in the back. So you see these dents in the back. doesn't mean she has the dent in her brain necessarily, but those are injured cells that need help. And so ideally, you know, if you rescan the brain after doing some healing work, it should sort of smooth out and buff out is what it would look like. Yeah. Um, here's some data on keto. Uh, looking at core nutrients, we want to look at lots of different things like omega-3s, B vitamins, thinking about ginkgo, um, vitamin C, phosphatidylserine, acetyl L-carnitine. We're going to go through a couple, couple examples. Um, this is actually the, the uh, trial that I was talking about, the CRASH trial, which worse outcomes with corticosteroids. Um, like NAC, N-acetylcysteine has um, a good amount of data on it. It's, an, it's a molecule that increases... Uh, it's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, helps with that glutamate um, excess. And so it's really kind of an ideal nutrient for acute brain injury. And you may be aware of the study done in 2013. They had 81 active duty military professionals in the field of war. They get a concussion. They run to the medic's tent and they give them a big dose of NAC. They gave them four grams. And then uh, two grams twice a day for four days, and then one and a half grams twice a day for three days, so basically a week. Um, and uh, these, so they had two groups. The group that um, had the NAC had 81% reduction in symptoms after a week, and the group that didn't get the NAC had a 40% reduction in symptoms. So 
So 40% got better anyway, but 81% got better who took the NAC. So, you know, in, in the book, I talk about sort of a list of things in addition to the NAC, but that can be in like a, a kit. So it's like you have it in your glove box. So if you, God forbid, get in a car accident, you can just take some of these things immediately or you're on the sports field. You have it in, you know, you have your athletic tape, you have your ice packs, you have your little PBI first aid kit to take because we know brain cells are being damaged immediately. Why not? You can't see if there's damage. Why wait a week to see if you're going to have symptoms? Why not just take it? You know, take NAC, vitamin C, uh, omega-3 fish oils, curcumin, like the integrative therapeutic curcumin, which which sounds amazing. You know, um, there's lots of good curcumins out there. And Uh, on a lot of these nutrients like that are anti-inflammatories, is it a good idea to have like a loading dose first? Yes. Yes. So, you know, for example, um, it depends if it's a kid or adult, but essentially kids are like half the adult doses, a thousand milligrams twice a day or more of curcumin. Uh, and it's like that first week, but really it's the first month. I would consider the fir- first month to be acute. So if you actually are having a concussion, you know, I recommend a full month of sort of higher dose um, supplements like this. Uh, and th- certainly the first week. And if it's sort of like a, just a preventive prophylactic, hey, I hit my head on the on something, I saw stars for a second, I'm not really having symptoms, but I want to be cautious, which I recommend, you know, take it for at least a few days. Um, you know, but, and, and hopefully you're already optimizing your vitamin D levels. Um, yeah, vitamin D, if your levels are good before an injury, you're less likely to have post-concussion syndrome, if your levels are low before an injury of vitamin D, you're more likely to have post-concussion symptoms. Um, there's a study out of Oxford University about this. What do you like to see as an optimal vitamin D level? Oh, you know, 60 for a concussion, to 60 to 80. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's my recommendation. And um, I'm up here in Seattle in the Northwest. It's hard to get enough sunlight to get vitamin D levels up. You pretty much have to supplement. And vitamin C, simple old vitamin C. But it's actually a really potent um, antioxidant for the brain, especially after injury, you need more. Um, They did this study with vitamin C and E and severe brain injury and found that it helped. Um, uh, And they used, actually, in this one, they did a study with... um, 10,000 milligrams of IV vitamin C for TBI patients in uh, this Iranian study. And it found that it reduced brain swelling. And they also gave vitamin D via injection, 400 IUs a day, not that much. And that improved the outcomes of, of these patients, which for them, it's like sort of living, you know, they didn't die, you know, they, so it, it's just pretty amazing. So oral vitamin C, good stuff. Alpha lipoic acid reduces glial scar formation. Great antioxidant. Another simple one, vitamin or zinc, uh, is a significantly helpful treatment and um, after brain injury and also useful for ADHD symptoms at times. Um, uh, Amy and Clinks, we did this study with players. So we had 30 of them. And, uh, you know, prior to uh, the study, they were having on in general problems with attention, motivation, mood, and sleep. And they had 80% improvement after six months of essentially taking the supplements that we were talking about, uh, which is um, actually, oh, it's right here is a list. Uh, ginkgo, 120 milligrams a day. Ocetylserine, 150 milligrams a day. Acetyl L-carnitine, 1,000 milligrams a day. NAC, 600 milligrams. Alpha lipoic acid, 300 uh, Huprazine A, 150, even posting 15 milligrams, and then uh, three grams of fish oil a day and a high potency multi. And then we did have them exercise and treat sleep apnea if they had sleep apnea. So, sort of this holistic program didn't include hormone treatment, didn't include structural support. This was all prior to, to, to that, that work, but sort of you can have a significant, and this was like many years later. So it's not too late, even if you've had a brain injury um, 10, 20 years prior. 
it's not too late to at least try and improve healing and brain function and, and think about it in those terms. I think that's fascinating to think about how many of your patients you're treating who have had a brain injury. And that's maybe partly why they're getting better with a functional med approach is because you're helping their brain function better. And maybe part of it was a past injury. Um, this is a picture of a, a lineman who played uh, for 16 years and professionally he's now like 60 years old and essentially has dementia symptoms, can't find his way to the grocery store, he's angry, he's depressed, he's suicidal. And his brain looked a lot better after 18 months of care, you know, and this is, this is with hyperbaric oxygen, by the way. Uh, this is with supplements, exercise, diet, weight loss and hyperbaric oxygen, which is a really powerful intervention. It's an oxygen chamber, it's pressure, um, time intensive, expensive. You have to go in every day for like 40 sessions, maybe 80 sessions. Uh, however, it's uh, very powerful. Um, I was just listening to um, uh, somebody who was on uh, Dr. Hyman show talking about ketogenic diet. Uh, and this was mm -hmm. for cancer, but he was saying that if you get in hyperbaric oxygen while you're in ketosis, you'll get a, a, a real big bang for your buck. You'll get a bigger wow, benefit. With mitochondria, I bet. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense for brain injury. I hadn't considered that, but I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to start recommending that if people are on, able to do both. Gosh, that, that make, does make sense. Um, so it's because with keto, it, you're going to, it's not like you're at, uh, in ketosis technically the whole time. It's like, you're going to try and stay in for periods of time. Then you, you eat, you're going to go down, you're going to come back up again. Um, all these things affect it, but if you can try and peak while you're in hyperbaric, I think that, gosh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. somebody asked about fasting for tr traumatic brain injury, which has similar mm -hmm. benefits to ketogenic diet. Yeah, there's a couple animal studies on that actually, where they showed, um, the rats that, um, basically they had them fast after a brain injury survived more function better after the brain injury. I don't know about humans. You know, I think that's, that's very individualized, but you definitely don't want to eat a lot of sugar. And carbs afterwards, you, you would want to either intermittent fast, fast, keto, something at least low carb, higher protein and fat. Um, I think, you know, fasting is so individual because, you know, I, I think there's potentially some risk there. Like the brain is already low in glucose. You start fasting, there's that initial phase where it takes time to get into uh, ketosis and your brain might be suffering more initially. Um, even if it's helpful after a day or two, but maybe if you're used to fasting, you'll go into that faster. A lot of variables there, but um, yeah, it's interesting to think about. Um, oh, what, what about the use of uh, glutathione? Yeah, I think that's tremendous. I think um, harder to have in your first aid kit because it's so fragile, but you can actually get those little packets from... Um, Try, try fortify packets you could use. I, I think either one, NAC or glutathione, you know, there's that mouse study with the topical glutathione. I, I would, for humans, you know, the mouse skull is very thin uh, and they, they were, had, you know, they shaved it down. And so it was like almost like getting right into the brain. I think so human for a human to rub it on the back of the head, you don't think you get any absorption? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I would, yes. I would go more with, oral liposomal glutathione or NAC. And what about IV glutathione? Oh, that would be the best, yeah. If you can get it, yeah. Now, Steve be. asks, can you overdo IV glutathione? Steve, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you, uh, doctor. Um, yeah, um, I have a, a female patient who's got anxiety, depression, and her MD is giving her glutathione daily. With a million other things, they changed their meds. She's gone from Lexapro to Zoloft to Abilify, and plus daily glutathione last five days. And I'm concerned that's going to be over 
and daily IV glutathione. Correct. Okay. Hmm. Well, thank you. I think there is that risk, you know, detoxing too fast or sort of overwhelming the system. I think yeah. there is that risk. Um, I would kind of track with them and see, is she, is it helping? Is she getting better? Maybe she, she is soaking it up. If she's not getting better, you know, you may want to reduce it. Thank you. I mean, the other possibility mm -hmm. is if she's has any considerable amount of toxins and she's taking that much glutathione, mm -hmm. she might be liberating those toxins. And so she could be yeah. having a reaction because of that. So you, you might mm -hmm. consider adding some binders. Good idea. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. Kind of double-edged sword. Speaking of, um, glutathione, there's also exercise. Uh, should you exercise after a brain injury? The answer really is yes, you should exercise. Um, and and that, now out of Stanford, there's some recommendations, which I think make a lot of sense, is that you want to start exercising it pretty soon. As long as it's not worsening symptoms, you want to start increasing blood flow. You're going to get BDNF. And just sort of improves someone's mental state when they feel like they've been taken out of the game. Um, and uh, I recommend, yeah, looking into Stanford's um, um, standard protocols around this. It's very useful. There's some handouts that they have. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, somebody uh, also yeah. asked about uh, nitric oxide stimulators. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, I've... I've I haven't looked at it, to be honest. Be, be curious to go to PubMed and see what the literature shows. I think theoretically it makes a lot of sense. Right. Possibly um, increased blood flow. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Brain exercise. Also, we don't want to overdo it, but also very helpful to start. And you can do um, meditation. There's a quality of life study on mindfulness meditation after brain injury, uh, brain training with, um, uh, neurofeedback is really helpful, um, after brain injury as well. And, Oh, you know what? I want to ask a question about, um, exercise. What about, um, using, um, with exercise, something that, uh, restricts and increases oxygen flow. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I've heard of those devices. Yeah. Um, I just interviewed Dr. Heather Sanderson and she's using it as part of her Alzheimer's program in a, some mm. patients. Yeah. I have, is it to exercise with oxygen or a different one? I think so. It, she said okay. it, you get oxygen deficit and then, you, you have a control and then you have a lot of oxygen. Yeah. And you flood in. Yeah. That sounds like exercise with oxygen. I, I do recommend that for Alzheimer's and dementia. And if people can't do hyperbaric, I'll recommend it. But for brain injury, I just, I don't know. That's, it seems like those, those tissues are fragile and damaged. I think, I think it kind of depends. Like if it was acute first month, maybe a few months, I probably wouldn't but I would do hyperbaric. And then if it's more chronic, like it's been years or something like, I think then it would be a worth a try, certainly to kind of revitalize the, the brain and increase oxygenation. I, I would kind of look at where they're at in their recovery process. That's a great question. Yeah. I, I like it because it does have exercise in it and oxygen. So it makes sense. Now, now when you use hyperbaric oxygen, should antioxidants be restricted around the time of using the hyperbaric oxygen or is it, would that not, or would it be synergistic? Never, yeah, I, I think it would be synergistic. I mean, the hyperbaric oxygen is going to increase. It is, there is an antioxidant effect already. Um, and we're using it more not to kill stuff. We're using it more to, increase blood flow and oxygen and activate stem cell growth okay. and all of this. And, and really it's low uh, pressure, long periods of time. So this is showing a hard shell chamber, but it doesn't have to. I'd say most patients do the soft shell chamber, 1.3 right. and 1.4 atmospheres. And it's really the, 
the time in the chamber every every day, five days a week for 40 sessions, ideally, if they can swing that, reassess, they may even need more, or renting a chamber, buying a chamber. Um, big, big investment. If I only had one treatment, i say, okay, you can pick one thing, I might choose hyperbaric oxygen for brain injury um, because it helps so many people. But I also would suggest kind of, we don't want to, it's going to work better and you may not need it down the road. So it's like if you do the labs, um, you, you do the history, you do the testing, sort of this is my um, idea here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, first visit, you do diet, sleep, supplementation, exercise if needed, order labs. They come back, review the labs, change, tweak, um, add hormones, add nutrients. Uh, they should be, be getting better in the first one to three months. If they're not, then layer in hyperbaric oxygen. Then you know your investment is working. And this is similar to what I'll do for dementia patients as well sort of add the hyperbaric after a little bit of time unless you can afford it or you have access to it and you just want to do it and you you know acutely then do it you know there's no there's no risk or harm in layering it but what about red light therapy to the brain yeah great question um there there is some data on this um and I certainly recommended it. I've seen it work sort of 50-50. Some patients find it really useful. Uh, some not so helpful, like the Violite therapy, uh, therapy helmet. Um, there's a couple other ones out there that you put on the neck, infrared and red light. And uh, it makes sense. Like it turns on mitochondria and activates cells. But um, yeah, for some reason, it just hasn't been as as powerful as, as some other treatments. Susan asked about the use of vibration plates during the exercise for a traumatic brain injury. Like, is it a risk to vibrate them? Or much? could it be beneficial? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't really, you guys are asking questions I haven't thought about. This is interesting. Okay. Um, what, what do you think about it? The vibration plates, are, they, are there, is there any risk there? With the shaking, like I don't really understand. Doesn't think so. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I I could see where there could be a possible risk. Yeah, yeah. Might be too much at the beginning, maybe. Right, I think so. I wouldn't do it in the beginning. Um, Steve asked about magnetic therapy. We'll just send him for mm. an MRI. No. <laughs> 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 Steve, are you thinking like TMS or like exactly, exactly? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. There's some data on that actually for for brain injury after uh, sort of um, later stages if they're not getting better. And it's really cool. And is, is we've had some patients where we'll target using spec imaging. So you saw that guy with the low left temporal lobe, left frontal lobe. Okay, okay. Focus the magnet here. You know, left temporal lobe, left frontal lobe. And that, that's very helpful for a lot of folks. But um, yeah, I, I would say the strongest treatments are really some of the basics, like ketogenic diet, the supplements, um, and things like exercise, you know, and then fixing structural integrity. I can't, I can't uh, highlight that enough, how important it is to do the structural pieces, getting into your good chiropractor and getting things aligned is just, helpful for so many. Have you used peptides? Um, a little bit, a little bit. Um, I've been kind of cautious. I've kind of gone with what most of the literature shows and sort of the basics, but um, yeah, they, they're promising. They're powerful, powerful. Mostly I've used them with low growth hormones, like sermorellin and morellin right. and things like that. They're kind of, that's where I'll, I'll certainly use peptides um, because there's not a lot of other natural things besides exercise that work for increasing growth hormone levels. Yeah, I'm thinking like BPC-157, cerebrolysin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I use cerebrolysin a little bit. Um, 
couple cases didn't didn't seem to help, but I I'm not an expert. I think BP one fifty seven is a really good call for acute acute TBI. Maybe have you, have you tried that intranasal synapsin I mentioned? No, I was just thinking about that. Like, oh, that's an interesting. I've used it with Alzheimer's and dementia some, but it's a good idea to try for TBI. Certainly, yeah, I'll probably experiment with that now. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great group you have. Thank you. Um, any any um, any other questions? Everybody get their questions answered. Okay. Um, excellent. Um, how can uh, listeners, viewers who um, are here now or um, who are listening to this mm -hmm. on the recording, how can they get a hold of you, find out about your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, to you all here and, and the future listeners, I'm Dr. Chapik. I'm at Amen Clinics Northwest in Seattle. And we have a clinic here. There's 13 clinics across the country, uh, California, New York, Florida. Patients can uh, come here and see me in Washington. We have other great naturopathic doctors and other clinics and psychiatrists. Um, I yeah, do see patients via Zoom mostly. Um, and I also have a book, Concussion Rescue. So if you want more information, you want to read in depth, uh, it's designed to be used for clinicians as well as patients to help sort of think about how to approach this really important issue of traumatic brain injury. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank, thank everybody who joined and we'll see you next month. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or, and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a, a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.